Today we're beginning our last topic for the term, and we're going to talk about spectrophotometry, or as it's often commonly known, molecular absorbance spectroscopy. We're going to look at how we use the absorbance of light at specific wavelengths to calculate or determine the concentration of molecular species dissolved in a solution or in the gas phase. And it's important we draw a distinction here because when we talk about absorbance in absorbance spectroscopy, and we say that means molecular absorbance, we're drawing a distinction between atomic absorbance and molecular absorbance. And this is an important distinction to draw because as we're going to see, and you probably heard before, although it may have been a while since we had a discussion of this, when light interacts with a molecule or atom, one of the primary things that one of the primary events that occurs is electrons are excited from a lower electronic state to a higher energy electronic state. In an atom, the location of those electrons is pretty easy to pin down in the sense that they're moving from one atomic orbital to another atomic orbital. I say pretty easy to pin down a little bit facetiously, of course, because if you remember, orbitals are really just probability density statements, and the uncertainty principle prevents us from saying exactly where an electron is inside of an atom. However, the picture in a molecule is significantly more compli complicated still than an atom because unlike an atom, which is an isotropic sphere, in a molecule, molecules composed of multiple bonds connecting multiple atoms. Bonds allow atoms to bend, stretch, scissor, rotate, and this couples the interaction between where the electrons reside in the molecule with how the molecule is moving. What we say that means then is that the electronic and the row vibrational states of the electron are coupled, which provides a greater option of possible energies for the electrons inside the molecule. As a result, electronic states in atoms are more discrete than they are in molecules, and so essentially atomic, which is another way of saying that atomic orbitals are a little more straightforward and easy to understand than molecular orbitals are. However, in terms of determining the concentration of an analyte using the molecular electronic structure of a molecule, that remains relatively straightforward. And so while we'll talk about the physical process behind molecular absorbance spectroscopy as part of this module, we are going to focus more on the analytical side of it and how we use a linear relationship between light absorbed and analyzed concentration, in other words, Beer's law, to determine the concentration of our molecular analytes. All right, so in your pre-lecture materials, I asked you to brush up a little bit on light and some of the basic calculations related to the energies and wavelengths of photons. The thing to remember in, for our purposes is that light is any form of electromagnetic radiation. So when we say light as human beings, we are biased towards visible light because that's what we see. However, all electromagnetic radiation, whether you're talking about light, light wavelengths we can see, the colored portion of the electromagnetic spectrum to our eyes, or the invisible portions like UV light, gamma rays, infrared light, radio waves, they're all part of the same phenomenon. They just have different energies. And the way the molecules in our eyes work that interact with visible wavelengths of light allow us to see and perceive different colors of energy inside the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so as the discipline has grown up, you're going to find that myself and pretty much anyone who, talk, who's in, who works in spectroscopy and talks about spectroscopy shorthands common everyday terms that we use about light, like color, and extends them to all aspects of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum, even the wavelengths and energies of the spectrum that we can't see with our own eyes, but we can perceive with instrumentation. So in classical physics, light is modeled as an oscillating electromagnetic field. So it has an, it's a sine wave essentially operating in two planes, perpendicular or orthogonal to one another. And one plane represents the movement of the electric field. And if you have a moving magnetic field, there, or a moving electric field, there must also be a moving magnetic component that goes along with it. So you have these two orthogonal waves that constitute a light wave in classical physics, and they're at 90 degrees to each other. That's what we mean by orthogonal or orthogonality in physics. And 
the behavior of the wave can be described by a specific number of mathematical features, most commonly its wavelength, the distance between crests or troughs in physical space of the wave, the frequency, the number of times the wave front crosses a specific point in space per second, so number of events per time, and the energy, capital E. The, there's an inverse relationship between frequency and energy, where the frequency wavelength product is the speed of light in a vacuum C, and the energy is proportional to the frequency mu, the frequency nu, the energy of the light wave is nu times Planck's constant. We'll go over the value of that, or we went over the value of Planck's constant in your pre-lecture materials. To make sure that's one you reacquaint yourself with, we also went over the value of the speed of light c. And energy is inversely related to wavelength. So this gives us one of our fundamental shorthands when we talk about visible spectroscopy specifically, we often talk about what color of light a solution absorbs, and we shorthand color and energy. Because the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy, and the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. Therefore, we say bluer, shorter wavelength, to mean higher energy, or we say redder or shifted red to indicate of movement to lower energy where the wavelength is longer. So the pre-lab lecture or the pre-lecture activity is really focused in on getting you back to thinking about how wavelength and energy particularly are related to one another for a light wave. Because in terms of spectroscopy, that's something that spectroscopy is shorthand all the time. Color and energy. Long wavelength, low energy. High wavelength, short energy. And the language becomes so wrapped up itself, spectroscopists start just saying things like blue shift to mean the wavelength shifted to a higher energy. It shifted in the blue direction. So we're going to do a little bit of this kind of recalibration. Hopefully you started that with pre-lecture pre activity. If you didn't do the pre-lecture activity yet, I encourage you to pause the video, make sure you get that pre-lecture activity done, and go through at least some of the reading before you get into the video. Here. It turns out, though, that because of the way that in which light, particularly visible light and ultraviolet light, interact with molecules, we can learn, first and foremost, a lot about the electronic structure of molecules based on how they absorb visible and ultraviolet light. But even more importantly, from an analytical standpoint, we can quantify molecules based on the amount of light absorbed by a solution containing the amyloid. And today we're going to talk about the mechanics of how we do that in theory. All right, so the first thing we want to talk about is the molecular picture, what happens to an analyte molecule when it absorbs light. When an atom or molecule absorbs light, it gains energy and it becomes excited. And what we mean by that, that can take several forms, but when you're talking about ultraviolet and visible light, what that means specifically is the high energy electrons, the, ele energy, the electrons living in the highest occupied molecular orbital, get promoted to the lowest, un or what was formerly the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So if we're talking about a molecule absorbing ultraviolet or visible light, we're talking about electrons getting excited. What exactly happens to the electrons when it interacts with light actually depends a lot on the energy of light. And so depending on the energy of light that interacts with a molecule, excitations can take many forms, excitation of electrons, breaking of bonds, or changes in molecular motion. We, in this module, since we're talking about UV and visible light, we're going to be talking about the wavelengths of light or the energies of light that cause electrons to be excited within the molecule, but there are other things that can happen to a molecule when it interacts with light. And the general rule to remember is that the more the higher energy the light is, the more destructive its interaction with the sample molecule is going to be. This, of course, makes fundamental sense to us just in terms of biological organisms that walk around under the sun. We know that we should avoid high energy light, so there we go using light to describe all electromagnetic radiation, we should, we should avoid high energy electromagnetic radiation, x-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet light. Anything that's higher energy than blue right, light, we need to limit our exposure to because it can cause chemical and physical damage to the molecules that make up our cellular components and tissues, right? Too much x-ray exposure can damage your DNA, lead to mutations. Even a little bit too much gamma ray 
exposure can cause significant DNA damage and in short amount of time can lead to radiation, uh, radiation poisoning, cancer, and even death in terms of small acute exposures, of course. And it's worth remembering that too much of any light, basically, can be hazardous to you. But the idea is that qualitatively, the higher energy the light, the less light exposure it takes to do you damage. So with a little bit too much x-ray exposure, you can become quite sick or even die. If you get too much x-ray exposure consistently over a number of years, that puts you at a significantly increased risk for cancer. And in general, though, it takes a lot to get too much x-ray exposure. In terms of the x-rays that we're exposed to in our society routinely, say at the dentist or at the doctor, you actually get more x-ray exposure generally on a prolonged plane trip than you do x-ray exposure from a healthcare professional diagnosing you with something. However, if you have concentrated x-rays in certain man-made apparatus like synchrotrons and particle accelerators, you can actually become, if safety considerations fail, and there are many, many safety considerations and protective safeguards in place at such institutions, you can actually be exposed to a concentrated beam of what is known as white x-rays, intense primary high-energy x-rays that can burn a hole right through you like a laser in a science fiction movie. Ultraviolet light, as you guys all know, living at high elevation in Colorado, ultraviolet light is higher energy than visible light, and with too much ultraviolet exposure, you can become at increased risk for skin cancer, right? and there's the potential to damage the photosensitive molecules in your eyes. It takes a lot of ultraviolet exposure to do that, but at higher elevation and with your somewhat thinned ozone layer now, you are at higher risk for skin cancer. However, ultraviolet light can't really penetrate that far below your skin, so your cancer exposure is limited to melanoma and kind of surface cancer. All, the, all this is a long roundabout way of saying is that for wavelengths of light that are extremely high energy, if these energy, if these, these higher energy light rays or photons, if you prefer the non-classical Einstein model of light particles, these higher energy electromagnetic rays are more likely to break chemical bonds in a molecule and actually kick electrons out of the molecule. That's why they do damage to biological cells in your body. If you're in the ultraviolet or visible region of the spectrum, light interacting with a molecule generally causes electron excitation from the highest occupied molecular orbital to what was formerly the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And as a result, you get electronic excitation. Excitation of electrons from a lower energy state to a higher energy state within the molecule. Red wavelengths of light are the lowest energy wavelengths of light that exist in the visible spectrum. And not surprisingly, if you send wavelengths of light that are longer than red wavelengths, so longer than about 700 nanometers, at a molecule, instead of getting electronic excitation, you just get molecular wiggling. You get vibrations and rotations. These types, all these types of light molecule interactions can be used for specific type of analytical techniques. We're going to focus in only on electronic excitation inside of molecules, and that type of excitation is brought about when the molecule is radiated by either ultraviolet light or visible light. X-ray based techniques and gamma ray based techniques are more destructive, and although for those of you who are going on instrumental analysis, you will see there are instrumental techniques out there that take use of, make use of these types of ionizing radiation to establish the presence and concentration of amylites. And for those of you who are taking or will soon take organic chemistry, you are of course familiar or going to be familiar with how we, we can use lower energy photons infrared and microwave radiation to excite vibrational and rotational excitations of chemical bonds, infrared spectroscopy to establish the presence of specific types of bonds, carbon oxygen bonds, carbon nitrogen bonds, carbon carbon double bonds within molecules. There are many instrumental techniques that are based on all these interactions of light with analytes, but for the purposes of introductory spectrophotometry or what we call UV vis absorbance spectroscopy, we're really going to key in on ultraviolet and visible light 
ultraviolet and visible light waves, which cause the excitation of electrons from the HOMO to the LUMO in these specific molecules. All right, so really we want to focus on today, having just nailed down kind of the main idea that in a molecule, when it absorbs light, electrons are excited from one electronic state to another electronic state. We want to talk about how we can use the amount of light absorbed by the analyte to determine the concentration. We essentially want to teach you how to use Beer's Law today. So the thing to remember is that spectrophotometry is enabled by a device called a spectrophotometer, which will be our last lecture topic for the term. It's the, that's the same model device as what we used for the iron analysis lab, a SPEC-20, which you've used previously in general chemistry probably, or a Helios Gamma UV-Vis spectrophotometer are both examples of spectrophotometers, instruments designed to measure the amount of light absorbed by a sample at a specific wavelength. So always keep that in mind. When we say wavelength, we're talking about what wavelength of light, what specific color of light can we pick out of the whole electromagnetic spectrum to shoot at a sample and see how it reacts. In terms of quantifying the analyte, we only record the wavelength of light that we queried the sample with. We only record the wavelength so that people can reproduce the experiment and get the same absorbance values. What we're actually measuring is how much light gets absorbed by the sample on a per molecule basis. That's absorbance. And so to understand what's happening, it might be worth jaunting back to the lab page and re-reviewing the, the short lecture on how a spectrophotometer works. But like I said, we'll go into that in a lot more detail on Friday. The principal picture, though, is the spectrophotometer, the device to measure the absorbance of our sample, is equipped with a couple of fundamental components, one of which the monochromator is responsible for picking out a specific wavelength of light to shoot at the sample. That light then either passes through the sample or gets absorbed by the analyte within the sample. We'll see on Friday there are actually some other real-world options that can interfere with that that we need to be aware of, but that's our basic picture. So light goes into the sample, and if it's the right wavelength of light to interact with our analyte, some of it will get absorbed. Some of it won't get absorbed. The part that doesn't get absorbed connects to the detector, and the detector then is in a position to compare how much light passed through to the detector when the sample wasn't there versus how much light was able to pass through the sample when the detector was there. And the first and primary function of the data analysis side of spectrophotometry is for the instrument to tell you how much of the original light was absorbed by the sample, and it represents that with a specific quantity known as transmittance, which is abbreviated with a capital T. Transmittance is a ratio that, at a specific wavelength of light, compares the amount of light that passes through, or the power of the light, capital P, that passes through when the sample is present versus the in amount of incident light, capital P naught, that passed through when no sample was present between the source and the detector. And so this transmittance is just a ratio of power of light that passed through when the sample was there to power of light that passed through when the sample wasn't there. And therefore transmittance as a measurement is a decimal value between zero and one. Again, for those of you who are in organic chemistry right now, you have some experience with FTIR, and in FTIR spectroscopy, transmittance is directly measured, but it's reported as a percent transmittance, where you take the ratio and you multiply it by 100% to make it a percentage rather than a decimal. In UV-Vis absorbance spectroscopy, though, where we're measuring ultraviolet and visible wavelengths, the amount of light transmitted by the sample isn't linearly correlated with the analyte's concentration. However, there's a related property that does correlate linearly with the analyte's concentration, and that's the absorbance, A, which is, of course, how we performed our iron lab. Right? Now, absorbance and transmittance are closely related, but they're not the same property. So absorbance is the negative base 10 log of the transmittance. So if you take your transmittance decimal value and you take the negative log of it, much like you're doing the pH measurement, you will get the absorbance of the sample. So essentially what the instrument is doing for you is the instrument is making a direct comparison about how much light passed through the sample when 
the sample was present in the beam path, a point between the source, the lamp, and the detector. And if you take the negative log of that ratio, that is your absorbance. So that's how absorbance and transmittance are mathematically related to one another. That turns out to be hugely useful for calculating the concentration of our analog. All right, so I'm going to lay out the course of the whole lecture. If you got onto D2L this morning, you've seen all the PowerPoint slides for the week already. I'm just going to break all those PowerPoint slides up into smaller lectures where today we're going to talk about Beer's Law and the process of measuring and absorbance, how we relate absorbance to sample concentration. Then we're going to follow it up. I'm just going to put the rest of the lectures up on Wednesday. You can choose to watch them Wednesday or Friday, but essentially we won't be introducing any new lecture materials because, of course, our big thing for the week is your exam number three. Right? Now, there will the absorbance material will be covered on exam number three. Not everything from these lectures will be on exam number three, but you'll probably want to have watched and made it through all these lectures before you turn in your exam on Friday. Okay. So after talking about Beer's Law and the, the way an absorbance spectrum looks, or absorption spectrum in slightly older language, we'll talk about how to identify the key components of a spectrophotometer. We'll talk about how we can measure the concentration of two analytes in a mixture simultaneously. We'll talk about some of the applications of absorbance spectroscopy. So in terms of reading, I hope that you've managed to make it your way a little bit through the reading already. If you haven't finished it yet, keep pushing on. You should be reading in, cha in Harris chapters 18, 19, and 20. You'll want to read sections 18.1, 18.2, 18.4, 19.1 through 19.4, and 20.1 through 20.5. I've also assigned homework to number seven, which won't be due until finals week. But again, looking at the problems on that homework will probably help you with some of the absorbance problems on the take-home exam this week. Quite a bit of new vocab pickup. I'll try to point it out and give you as clear a working definition as I can as we go along, of course. So having talked a little bit about what absorbance is, which is the negative log of the light transmitted by the sample, we are now in a position to talk about how we can use an absorbance measurement to calculate the concentration of the analyte. And this is pretty straightforward. It's something that you've used before in at least a couple of courses now. And it's a pretty simple equation, so I'm going to just kind of charge head along into this. If there are questions, I'll be on Zoom again for class every day this week. So if I've gone a little too fast with some of, uh, through some of this for you, please don't be shy about coming back and asking me more questions. Because, you know, in general, I, my impression is that students find the manipulation of Beer's Law pretty straightforward. So I just want to knock it out today, get straight to it. If you have questions about something specific that I haven't explained clearly enough, please don't be shy about asking me for further clarification. All right, so the number one analytical chemistry law of spectrophotometry is Beer's Law, which is this equation right here, which says that the absorbance of your sample is equal to epsilon BC, where C is the concentration of the sample. Generally, it's going to be the molar concentration of the sample, but it can actually be concentration in any units or any situation. B is what's known as the path length. This is important in terms of scaling the amount of light transmitted. And the idea is most cuvettes, those quartz cells that you hold your sample in, have a path length of one centimeter. Some of them don't, but for the most part, when you're doing UV vis spectroscopy, the sample length in your cuvette is going to be one centimeter. Epsilon, then, is a constant which relates the amount of light absorbed by each molecule of the sample to a given amount of space that the light has to pass through. Because you have to remember, when you're making a measurement based on light absorbance, light can be absorbed by the sample, but the intensity can also just fall off or be scattered away, or be scattered away the more of the sample the light has to pass through. And so this constant epsilon is known what's known in, in most chemistry circles as the molar absorptivity coefficient. In physics and engineering and material science, it's known as a molar extinction coefficient which counts for the fact that in materials you have both absorbance and scattering processes from the analyte. This is a measure of how much light a single molecule absorbs at the chosen wavelength over a specific path length. In general, when we use Beer's Law in class, 
the absorptivity coefficient will be shown to you, or you'll be asked to determine the absorptivity coefficient in inverse molar inverse centimeter. So the units on epsilon are 1 over molar times centimeters. These path length, unless I say otherwise, you can always assume with Virilaw calculation the path length is fixed at one centimeter. There are some rare spectroscopies out there where the path length may be longer than that, but one centimeter is pretty standard for molecular spectroscopy studies. So this is Beer's Law. The utility of Beer's Law, of course, is there is a linear relationship then between absorbance and concentration. And in general, all you need to do to use Beer's Law is to know the molar absorptivity coefficient for the compound you're working with. If you don't necessarily know the absorptivity coefficient, that's okay from an analytical standpoint because you can still construct a calibration model. And when you run your calibration model and determine the line of best fit, as we did with the iron lab, the constant that describes the slope of the line of best fit in your calibration model will essentially still be epsilon. And in fact, from a quantitative standpoint, it's better to do quantification experiments with a calibration model than just make a single measurement with Beer's Law because it minimizes sources of error. All right, so in general, like I said, I feel like people find beer, using Beer's Law to be pretty straightforward, but if I go over anything a little too quick here, feel free to sing out metaphorically later over the internet, ask me to slow down or re-explain. In general, to use Beer's Law, you're going to be given a situation where you know concentration and extinction coefficient, and you're asked to find absorbance, or you know absorbance and concentration, and you're asked to find extinction coefficient, Generally, the path length is fixed at one centimeter, and you know two of the other variables, and you're asked to find the value of the missing variable because it's a linear relationship between absorbance and analyte concentration, and that's the power of Beer's Law. So let's say we have a solution of potassium permanganate. This is a, this is a water-soluble ionic compound that generally gives you a vibrant purple color. For some of you who are in Organic 2 lab this term or were in Organic 2 lab previously, you've seen permanganate before. It's a very colorful compound, liable to stay your hand, stain your hands. It has this kind of red, pinky, purple cabbage color. All right, we are analyzing a solution of potassium permanganate, and we find this sentence is phrased a little awkwardly, but we can break it down. We are told about the data that the peak absorbance of a solution of potassium permanganate with a concentration of 3.16 times 10 to the negative third molar at a specific wavelength is 6.54. So the absorbance is 6.54. Here's the concentration of the permanganate solution. We're measuring the potassium permanganate absorbance at a wavelength of 555 nanometers, which is green light, incidentally and we're told the path length of the cell. We want to use Beer's Law to find the molar absorptivity coefficient of the solution, and then we want to make a prediction if the concentration of the solution was decreased fourfold, what is the new absorbance going to be? Okay, so notice we're given a wavelength, but once again, the wavelength is only there so that we can reproduce the experiment and we know specifically at which wavelength we're, the compound is absorbing light right now. And in terms of the molar absorptivity coefficient, compounds have different molar absorptivity coefficients at different wavelengths. So we're trying to determine the molar absorptivity, the epsilon for this solution, or for potassium permanganate in water at a specific wavelength, which is 555 nanometers. Other than that, the wavelength doesn't enter into the problem. If we want to know the molar absorptivity coefficient, we're just going to use Beer's Law with the concentration, the path length of the cell, and the absorbance, and we're going to rearrange and solve for epsilon. So from Beer's law, epsilon is equal to absorbance divided by path length times concentration. We know all those numbers. We're going to plug them in. They already have the appropriate units. So we have 6.54 is the absorbance divided by 3.16 times 10 to the negative third divided by one centimeter. Tracking our units, we get 2,069.6 inverse molar inverse centimeter for the absorbance coefficient. So that's 2,700 for the value of the absorptivity coefficient of three sig figs, or 2,100 for the extinction coefficient to two sig figs. Okay, so moving on to the second question. If the concentration of the solution was decreased fourfold, what will the new absorbance be? 
Well, you could calculate what one-fourth of 6.54 is and solve for, sorry, uh, you could calculate what one-fourth of the concentration, 3.16 times 10 to the negative third molar is, and use that in conjunction with Beer's law to find the, the new absorbance of the solution quantitatively. But we know mathematically if concentration and absorbance scale linearly with one another, if the whole point of Beer's law is actually in this question, if the absorbance, if the concentration is decreased by four, the absorbance must also be decreased by four. So if our new concentration is one fourth of 3.16 times 10 to the negative third, our new resulting absorbance must be one fourth of 6.54. Therefore, the absorbance of the new solution should be 1.64. And remember that absorbance is unitless because it's the log of the ratio. Therefore, it has no physical units associated with it. You may see it reported by instrumentation as arbitrary units, but that's just a result reflecting how the instrument measures it. Absorbance has no units because it's the log of a ratio. So mathematically, that eliminates your units any way you want to look at it. So that's the basic use of Beer's Law. Again, if you have any questions on that, let me know. But in general, I find that people remember how to pick up and play with Beer's Law in a pretty straightforward fashion. In the real world, you can't use Beer's Law all the time because there is a point at which that linearity breaks down. And in most real world cases, if your absorbance value is 6.54, then you're not going to be in a linear regime of Beer's Law. But we can treat it like we are for this problem. Most of the time in the real world when you're making measurements using Beer's Law, for Beer's Law to hold, your absorbance needs to be between like 0 and maybe about 1.2 absorbance units. All right, so in terms of an absorbance measurement, how does that actually relate to the physical observable properties of the solution? Well, an absorbance is reflected in what's known as an absorbance spectrum. And an absorbance spectrum shows how light is absorbed as a function of wavelength. So wavelength typically in nanometers goes on the x-axis of an absorbance spectrum, and the y value is absorbance. It's the negative log of the transmittance. The higher the value the higher the y value at a specific wavelength, the more light is absorbed by the sample at that wavelength. You can take absorbance spectra for anything, molecules, materials. Um, I work with gold nanoparticles in my research. Gold nanoparticles are a pleasure to both work with and study using absorbance spectroscopy because they have fantastic colors that show up in a really pronounced way in their absorbance spectra, and their extinction coefficients are massive. Some of them are around 1 times 10 to the 6th up to 1 times 10 to the 9th uh, inverse molar, inverse centimeter. So they provide beautiful vivid colors even at low concentrations. So you can take absorbance spectra of materials. You can take absorbance spectra of molecules. On the slide here, we're showing you the absorbance spectrum of a couple of different types of chlorophyll and carotenoids. So chlorophyll obviously is the mo molecule responsible for the business end of photosynthesis. There are actually multiple chlorophyll molecules out there in plants. They all have similar but distinct absorbance spectra. And you can kind of get a feel for how the absorbance spectrum of specific molecules relates to their color by remembering that in general, in reality, it's a little more complicated than this, but in general, the wave, the if you spun all the visible light from red to blue out on a color on a color line like this, as though you're looking at a slice of a rainbow, and then twisted around the ends around so that the blue and the red met, you would essentially find that any physical object appears to be the color that's opposite the primary color that it absorbs. I'm not sure primary color is the right way to say that in that context. What that means is if chlorophyll, which we know appears green to our eyes, if chlorophyll appears green, then chlorophyll should be absorbing most strongly wavelengths other than green in the electromagnetic spectrum. And indeed it is. Regardless of which chlorophyll you're talking about, chlorophyll absorbs most strongly in the blue region of the spectrum and then absorbs fairly strongly in the red region of the spectrum, leaving the green and yellow wavelengths to be reflected back off the surface of the plant leaf or stem and it appears green. So the color of plants is largely a direct consequence of the type of organic molecules they have either for photosynthesis or other essential metabolic functions.
And you can contrast chlorophyll, one molecule that's very common in plants, to another colorful molecule from plants, which is keratin. Sorry, which are the keratinoids, so essentially carrots, right? Keratinoids contain a colorful pigment molecule, beta-keratin, if I remember correctly, which absorbs light in a different region of the spectrum than chlorophyll does. While it still absorbs strongly in the blue, it also absorbs strongly in the green. It doesn't really absorb in the red. But because it absorbs in the blue and the green so strongly, plants that are keratinoids and are high in this pigment molecule appear yellow to orange to red, depending on exactly where these wavelengths are. And as a result, photosynthesizing plants appear green. Carrots, which are high in the concentration of this pigment molecule, appear yellow-orange. Peppers are in a similar situation. And so it may help to remember flora in terms of thinking that whatever wavelength an object or solution absorbs most strongly, the color that you see with your eyes is the opposite. And so this is kind of key to making simple connections between the energy of electronic states in molecules and the colors of light that they absorb. So in terms of the absorbance spectrum, the absorbance spectrum is more useful in terms of telling you which regions of the spectrum the pigment molecules absorb the light in and what that means about their electronic structure. The value of the absorbance at a specific wavelength is what's used to quantify the analyte in a spectrophotometry experiment. And there's some fantastic examples. People learned how to manipulate color because humans have apparently always considered color to be extremely powerful particularly when it comes to art, people learn techniques for manipulating color long in advance of actually proving how it works. So I've left a YouTube link here, and some of you may have heard me drone on about this before if you had a class from me before, but this is one of the coolest pieces of historical art and kind of material archaeology in the world. This is a Roman drinking goblet from the late 300s-ish A.D., um, comes from kind of uh, the Aegean Sea area of the Roman Empire, so what is now modern-day Greece, somewhere between Greece and Turkey and Cyprus, and it's what's known as the Lycurgus Cup. And the Lycurgus Cup is a fantastic artifact, not only because of its intrinsic value, a lot of gold and silver in the air, it's got a lot of beautiful glass inlay that forms kind of the main, uh, the main portion of the cup, but the Lycurgus Cup is particularly cool because it's the early example of an application of nanotechnology. And obviously it was developed before people knew what chemistry was, really, let alone what nanotechnology was. But early cultures and human cultures throughout history have been incredibly clever at coming up with empirically derived, brute force methods ways to take advantage of cool chemistry long before they understood exactly what they were manipulating. And the Romans and Egyptians actually knew how to make nanoparticles. And we didn't appreciate how important the properties of nanoparticles were for specific applications until about 30 years ago. Nevertheless, the Romans and the Egyptians could make nanoparticles. However, they used them mostly just for art and kind of quack medicinal remedies. Like, for instance, something that's come back in the current corona crisis is the Egyptians, Egyptians, the Egyptians and Romans believed that drinking colloidal gold and silver so solutions of gold and silver nanoparticles, as it turns out, is really good for your health. Was there any reason for this? No, not really. It's precious, expensive metals that make you more royal inside that obviously makes you healthier and closer to the gods. Some people still believe that. If you're in the mood for seeing what, uh, and it's not outright harmful, people can live a full and happy life uh, ingesting gold and silver metal. However, it does have a noticeable effect on you, and if you haven't seen it before, and you're interested what uh, incorporation of nanoparticles as deposits into your skin does to your skin coloration, you should Google search Argyria sometime and see what happens when you get in the habit of drinking colloidal silver. doesn't kill you, but people can see that you're drinking collo uh, colloidal silver. Anyway, Lycurgus Cup. Lycurgus, Lycurgus Cup is fascinating because the Romans found out how to not only make gold and silver nanoparticles, but to cast, it in, cast them into glass and take advantage of their absorbance and scattering properties. And so what they did was they cast the glass for this frieze right here, which depicts some Dionysian rebels, a really good time in ancient Rome or ancient Greece, a lot of wine being ingested, 
a lot of sex to be had. Everyone was just having a good afternoon. The point is, because there are nanoparticles present in the glass, and because when something absorbs light and sits between your eye, which functions like the detector on a spectrophotometer, when something that can absorb light sits between the light source and your eye, which is the detector, you don't see the colors that it absorbs. And this is beautifully illustrated in the Lycurgus cup, which appears green, very beautiful in its own right, when illuminated from the outside. But when it's illuminated from the inside, or it has different colored liquids inside it, the gold nanoparticles filter out the green wavelengths of light that are passing through the glass, and the glass appears red when lit from the inside. And not only does it appear red when it's lit from the inside, it actually appears different colors depending on what you have in it. So if you have water, it appears one color. If you have wine, it appears one color. If you had like a salad dressing, an oil and vinegar mixture, it would appear a totally different color. And so the Romans knew how to take advantage of nanotechnology and the absorbance of light to do some beautiful artistic things. Couldn't explain what was happening necessarily, but we're in a position to explain it now. This Lycurgus cup looks pretty much, works pretty much exactly the way a spectrophotometer is used to quantify the concentration. And actually, if you set up the right technique, you could calculate the concentration of the gold and silver nanoparticles in the glass of the cup, as long as you knew their extinction coefficients. If you've never seen this spec before, check it out for yourself after the video is done. I've included a link to the British Museum exhibit, which, uh, which is the museum which has permanent custody of the Lycurgus cup. I got to see it once on travel, uh, the traveling uh, exhibition at the Chicago Museum of Art. It was amazing. But check out the video and you'll see that color shifting effect for yourself. So a bit of a digression, but because gold and silver nanoparticles are a little different from molecules, you can tune their absorbance wavelength based on the size of the particle. Just by putting in different sizes of gold and silver nanoparticles, you could change the color of the glass. And that's an artistic effect that has been taken advantage of in not only the Lycurgus cup, but also in many stained glass windows and churches and cathedrals throughout history. The last thing we want to do today is actually talk about using Beer's law in a sample analysis problem. So here our setup is we are going to analyze for benzene. For those of you going on instrumental analysis, an instrumental analysis lab, this would likely be the very first instrumental analysis laboratory experiment that you do. So benzene concentration can be determined spectrophotometrically, i.e. by use of a spectrophotometer, by analyzing the compound's absorbance spectrum at a wavelength of 256 nanometers. Quick, what color light is that? Trick question, that's ultraviolet light. We don't know, at least most of our eyes are not going to know what color that is. So like most organic molecules, benzene absorbs very strongly in the, in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum, not necessarily the visible region of the spectrum, but that Beer's law still applies there. So benzene absorbs ultraviolet light at 256 nanometers when benzene is dissolved in hexane. So we're analyzing a mixture of benzene dissolved in hexane. It's an organic solution. The absorbance of a benzene solution with an unknown concentration gives the data below. A calibration model prepared from standards of benzene in hexane gave a best fit line of Y equals 203.3 inverse molar times X plus a Y intercept of 0.035 we would like to find the benzene concentration in the sample. And we're given two pieces of information. A blank was analyzed and had an average absorbance of 0 0.070 plus or minus 0 0.004 at 256 nanometers. And an unknown was analyzed and gave an absorbance of 0.592 plus or minus 0 0.008 at 256 nanometers. We want to use the calibration model to figure out the concentration of benzene. One more thing to notice in terms of a real world absorbance analysis is that when you measure a blank, oftentimes the absorbance of the blank, even though it has no benzene, is not actually zero at that wavelength. It's just a really low number. So the instrument picks up some background signal, which is reflected in the value of the blank of 0 0.07 absorbance units. So our general procedure here is going to be to find the absorbance value of the unknown, the average, plug that into our calibration model, Solve for x to determine the concentration of benzene in the sample. However, good practice would be to take and correct for the fact that there is some background signal and the background absorbance at 256 nanometers is not zero absorbance units, it's 
So first, we do what's called a background correction or a signal subtraction. We take the average value observed for the unknown and we subtract the 0 0.07 from the 0.592 to account for the fact that when just the cuvette or when just the cuvette and the solvent are there, a small amount of light is absorbed in that wavelength. And so if we subtract that out, our new number will better reflect what the molecule, the analyte of interest, is actually absorbing. So if your blank absorbance is non-zero, always subtract it off and do that background correction first. I say always, always in quotation marks. There are certain specific situations where it's not the first thing you do, but in general you do. So our corrected absorbance just due to the benzene is 0.592 minus 0.070, having subtracted the background and coming up with an absorbance value of 0.522 just due to the benzene. Now we're ready to plug that adjusted absorbance value into our calibration model, and we should be able to find the concentration of the benzene. So using our calibration model and rearranging the y equals mx plus b, the analyte concentration x is equal to y minus b divided by the slope m. Our concentration of benzene is 0.522 minus 0.035 divided by 203.3 inverse molar, and our benzene concentration should be 2.40 times 10 to the negative third molar, or 2.4 millimolar. So that's it for our Beer's Law lecture today. When we, the very next lecture I'll upload is we'll talk about how to use Beer's Law in conjunction with a mixture of analytes that absorb at two different wavelengths to calculate the concentration of both analytes in a single sample. Then we'll move on to cover a few smaller topics talk about the spectrophotometer as an instrument, and that will be our lecture material for the term. So check this out. No, po uh, no post-lecture follow-up today, because I think the Beer's Law stuff is pretty straightforward, but if you have any questions on the schedule of events coming up before the end of the term, I will be on Zoom during the last half hour of class every day this week, as well as for the, the uh, half hour at least in each lab section. And please bring all your questions to me. You guys have done a great job staying level with the course throughout this rather difficult time, and I want to make sure we finish it up right. So you have, if you have any questions or concerns, please get in touch with me and let's figure out a path forward. I'll talk to you again in a little bit.